the cultural movements, of all the isms, romanticism remains the hardest to define, to pin down. The French poet genius Arthur Rimbaud, who wrote all his poetry before he was 17 and then never wrote another line, declared that romanticism has never been properly judged. Who was there to judge it? Rambo was right. Romanticism has never been properly judged. Scholars, critics, historians have spent lifetimes trying to grasp the essence of romanticism. And all the analysis, all the making of charts and lists and all the interpretations of symbols, all the academic effort to come to grips with romanticism goes totally against the grain of the romantics who couldn't stand the academic world. Their one unanimous plea in life was don't think, don't reason, feel. The only way to understand romanticism is to feel it, to hear it, to see it, and of course to read it, because the literature and the poetry of the great writers represents the heart of romanticism. It was literature that inspired a great deal of romantic music, romantic paintings, romantic journeys, romantic nightmares, romantic fashion. And one of the factors that makes romanticism so impossible to define is its all-embracing character, its inclusiveness. All Europe was caught up in the turmoil of ideas and attitudes it generated, and no area of art or life was immune. Politics, war, love, death, they were all romanticized. An excess of feeling, an excess of living, an excess of passion and of longing. The creative vitality was staggering. The Romantics were, above all, youthful, and they transformed the rational Europe of the 18th century into a volcanic continent erupting in its rejection of the sane and the sensible. The Romantics were crying, me, me, I, I, don't be afraid of feeling, down with middle age, down with the artificial, the contrived, the phony, down with the safe, the secure, the reasonable and the comfortable. The Romantics were against the old aristocracy based on birth and wealth. They were to create a new aristocracy, the aristocracy of genius. Society was to be transformed into a society of primitive and simple values in which nature would be elevated to the height of a new religion. For the Romantics, nature was not raw material to be trimmed and clipped into shape. It was a source of revelation, a fount of understanding. It was not vegetable, but visionary. Declared the visionary painter-poet William Blake, the tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing that stands in the way. But to the eyes of a man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. Blake saw no gap between his visionary world and the physical world around it. I see everything I paint in this world, but everybody does not see alike, he said. But for many of the romantics, the world around them could not match their aspirations and their visions. And banal reality was, for many, agonizing and tormenting. Madness or suicide claimed some of the finest talents, and death came to seem a seductive alternative to the heartache of being alive. Keats' line, for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, speaks for a generation. Keats' Ode to a Nightingale was written in the garden of this house, where he lived for the last few years of his short life. It's Wentworth Place in Hampstead. The exquisite verses written on a fine morning in May are full of the romantics' impatience with the finite reality around them, and full of an intense longing for a more ideal world. That I might drink and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim, fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known. The weariness, the fever, and the fret here where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despair, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. This passionate longing for the unattainable 
was the essence of romantic thought. The romantics longed for a world that they conceived of not through the careful reasoning of the mind, but impulsively through the heart and the soul. We still long for that other world. We still search for the natural answers to the world's conundrums. We still cherish the idea of an escape from the strictures and conventions of reasonable society. We live now with so many legacies of the Romantic Revolution, we are still so deeply involved with many of its revelations, questions, declarations, investigations and yearnings that it is impossible to see the movement as a whole, objectively, dispassionately. We are too involved. We are too much the products of that time. What we can do is to evoke the spirit of that short period. From the end of the 18th to the middle of the 19th centuries, where all the old ideas about how we should live, die, think, act, be, were brought to the boil and bubbled over. Blake's vow gave the movement its rallying cry. I must create a system or be enslaved by another man's. I will not reason and compare. My business is to create. Europe at the dawn of the 19th century, the Romantics have issued their challenge to create a new world on the wreckage of the old. With shattering impact, the stage is blasted clean by the French Revolution. The symbols of authority, God and King are toppled. Now as never before, it is the time for change, courage, innovation, experiment, utopias, art, hope, imagination. The world must be romanticized. In order to find its original meaning, the world must be romanticized. How to do it is still completely unknown. We will make the common and everyday become vibrant and significant. What is ordinary will become mysterious. The familiar will have the prestige of the unfamiliar, and the finite will seem infinite. Thereby, I romanticize it. Novalis, 1798. Poetry will take a giant step, a decisive step. A step which, like the jolt of an earthquake, will change the entire face of the world. Poetry will begin to be like nature, to mingle but not fuse in her creations, darkness with light, the grotesque with the sublime, the body with the soul, the animal with the spirit. Victor Hugo, 1828. July the 14th, 1789. The beginning of modern history. A Parisian riot turns into an attack on a royal prison. The seizure of the Bastille. The ultra-conservative statesman, Metternich, uses only eight metaphors to describe society. Volcano, plague, cancer, deluge, powder kegs, conflagration, influenza, and cholera. In Germany, the Confederation of the Rhine is created on the ruins of the Holy Roman Empire. Heinrich Heine, Schiller, and Goethe are there to bear witness. England tries to shut her eyes to what's happening in France, but Wordsworth is there to remind her. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. The cry rises up. Each man is unique. The new man is the individual. The new man is the free man. Classical versus romantic. The old regime versus the revolution. What is romantic is revolution. In his revolutionary study, Chopin creates the essence of romanticism. Virility, courage, defiance, rage, audacity, excess, imagination. Romanticism is not daydreaming, is not affectation, 
is not a language pose. To say romanticism is to say modern art. That is, intimacy, spirituality, color, aspiration towards the infinite, expressed by every means available to the arts. Charles Baudelaire. The distinguishing mark of this new era is a violent overflowing of feeling and an urgent search for passion, matched by the fierce determination to develop every caprice of the imagination to its ultimate conclusion. Even though the results may well affront good taste, decorum, and the gods of moderation and respectability. I have no love for reasonable painting. There is in me an old leaven, some black depth which must be appeased. If I am not quivering and excited like a serpent in the hands of a soothsayer, I am uninspired. Eugene Delacroix. Romanticism. There are no limits. Youth over middle age. Manes over bald heads. Enthusiasm over routine. The future over the past. In the romantic army, everyone is young. Racine, classical playwright, represents the past. Shakespeare, rediscovered, becomes the figurehead for the now. The elegant modulations of the literature created for Louis XIV was perfectly suited to his monarchy. It does not fit with this new age. France of the 19th century forges her own literature, her own art. It is not designed to bolster a monarch, but to support a people. Romanticism is their voice. Romanticism is the art of offering people the literary work which today, with their customs and beliefs, can give them the greatest pleasure. Classicism, in contrast, offers them the literature which gave the greatest possible pleasure to their great-grandfathers. Stendhal. To say romanticism is to say modern art, that is, intimacy, spirituality, color, aspiration towards the infinite, expressed by every means available to the arts. Baudelaire. I rose with the sun and I was happy. Rousseau. The rationalists spoke of the rights of the individual. The romantics glorified individuality. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in his dreams of a solitary walker and in his intimate confessions, records his passions and despairs. In introducing the me into literature, Rousseau cannot measure the incalculable consequences of his act. In effect, he revolutionizes all literature by writing in the first person. Moi, moi, me, me, je, je, I, I. I rose with the sun and I was happy. 
I tried to lose myself in space. My heart, tied up within the limits of beings, felt itself tightening. I was suffocating in the universe. I longed to leap into infinity. Like Rousseau, Europe is suffocating. She is suffering from claustrophobia. In Germany, a group of young writers fed up with the doctrines of the Enlightenment begin to portray turbulent emotion and forceful individualism. The movement is called Sturm und Drang, Storm and Stress. The leaders, Schiller, who kills everyone on stage in his play, The Robbers, and Goethe, who in his classic romantic novel, The Sufferings of Young Werther, has the doomed hero shoot himself in desperate circumstances. I turn inward on myself, and there I find a whole world, more in foreboding and somber longing than in actual vivid substance. Everything swims before me, and I face the world with a dreamy smile. Suicides become the aristocrats of death. How insane is he who cries, save me from death. He should cry, save me from life. Oh, death, how beautiful you are in the middle of the battle of life. Chateaubriand. takes the risks of passion. Passion is the risk of madness. Folly becomes the agent of liberation from the confines of reason. Death becomes the agent of liberation from the confines of life. Violence is not confined to the canvas or to the pages of literature. It is a vivid part of everyday life. Louis XVI was soon to remark this at his own expense. Hope and its twin disillusion walk hand in hand. Even on the very day of triumph at the Bastille, it is not enough to free the pathetic prisoners. The commandant and his garrison are butchered after they have surrendered. The we of the autocrats is over. It is the I of the citizen that is victorious. Rousseau triumphs but not for long. The blade of the guillotine severs heads. It severs hopes. Terror reigns. never left it. The 
poet André Chénier becomes a symbol for the Romantics. An enthusiastic supporter of the revolution, he is quickly disillusioned. The poet condemns the growing extremism, the violence, and the terror. In 1794, he is sent to the guillotine. His crime? Feeling. Belief. And a craving for justice. The revolution stood for the rights of man, liberty, equality, fraternity. It becomes the revolution of cannibal feasts and severed heads. The people want the absolute and get only absolutism. After the terror of Robespierre, Napoleon, who presents himself as a liberator and finally reveals himself as a tyrant. The romantics yearn for a model state where the individual can develop freely. They only find despotic states where nothing is more hated than the me. When in the silence of objection, no sound can be heard save that of the chains of the slave and the voice of the informer. When all tremble before the tyrant, and it is as dangerous to incur his favor as to merit his displeasure, the historian appears entrusted with the vengeance of nations. Chateaubriand. Chateaubriand, father of French Romanticism, is ordered into exile. The emperor and the inheritor of the French Revolution sees the intellect and independence and high-pitched sensibility of the Romantics as treason. There follows a catalogue of Romantic exiles. Madame de Stael publishes her book Germany in 1810, revealing to the French public the new ideas of Lessing, of Goethe, of Schiller, of Novalis, and Kant, and Schelling. The work is seized and destroyed upon the orders of Napoleon, and its author exiled. Madame de Stael makes a passionate plea for a dynamic literature springing from the experience of real life, from life as it is lived. In Russia, the poet Pushkin is deported. His letters confirming his atheism are intercepted by the police. Lermontov is arrested for writing a poem on Pushkin's death. Turgenev is confined to his property for writing about Gogol. Back in France, Victor Hugo is outlawed by Napoleon III. But to give oneself unreservedly to one's passions and convictions without heeding the results of so doing, be they creative or destructive, this is one of the major imperatives of Romanticism. Forgive me, freedom, oh, forgive me these dreams. I hear thy voice, I hear thy loud lament. Coleridge. As art moves closer to life, all over Europe artists are sent into exile and their art suppressed, censored, or destroyed. And all the arts of life, they changed into the arts of death. William Blake. The autocrats never had much time for the intellectuals, unless they doubled as courtesans. But the romantic intellectuals were for them the worst, because romanticism is entirely based on the idea of liberty. The romantic as exile, the romantic as wanderer, the romantic as outcast. In his solitude, in an exile which is an inner exile as much as an exile from his own country, the romantic creates his own world of the imagination. It is a region without boundaries and without rules. A nocturnal territory patrolled by the spirits of passion, folly, hallucination, death. The principal object in life is sensation. It is the feeling that we exist even in pain. It is this devouring void which leads us to play, fight, travel, drink. Lord Byron.
into the land of beyond, into the nocturnal depths. They descend to the bottom of the volcano, into the holy, unutterable, mysterious night, into that ideal state that every soul seeks, that has no place or name on earth. They live dangerously. They live life to death. The romantics sense themselves to be permanently in opposition. They are for the impossible and against everything else. They elect themselves to be outsiders. It's a position that makes many into heroes and many into martyrs. Byron's anti-hero Manfred is the prototype of the outsider. The outcast from society who glories in his own damnation. He spurns the prospect of salvation that the abbot offers. My son, I did not speak of punishment, but penitence and pardon. With thyself, the choice of such remains, and for the last, our institutions and our strong belief have given me power to smooth the path from sin to higher hope and better thought. The first I leave to heaven. Vengeance is mine alone. So saith the Lord, and with all humbleness, his servant echoes back the awful word. Old man, there is no power in holy men, nor charm in prayer, nor purifying form of penitence, nor outward look, nor fast, nor agony, nor greater than all these, the innate tortures of that deep despair which is remorse without the fear of hell, but all in all, sufficient to itself, would make a hell of heaven, can exorcise from out the unbounded spirit the quick sense of its own sins, wrongs, sufferance, and revenge upon itself. There is no future pang can deal that justice on the self-condemned he deals on his own soul. In the romantic army, everyone is young. It is a cult of youth, but not of children. They speak several languages, read Greek and Latin, are intellectually curious and alive. With fierce determination, they create a counterculture, a culture which will invent the future out of a new past. For the Romantics, the Greece where Byron died is not the Greece of heavy columns so admired and imitated by Napoleon, but the Greece of purity and democracy. It is ancient Greece rediscovered, not reconstituted. It is the Greece of the insurrection against the Turks, an uprising drowned in blood in 1822 at Chios. For inspiration from the past, the Romantics turn not to Rome, but to the Middle Ages. Their interests in the enchantments of medieval art and literature and Gothic buildings provides menacing and thrillingly gloomy settings for the English tales of terror by Horace Walpole, Walter Scott and Anne Ratcliffe. At length, the carriages emerged upon a heathy rock and soon after reached the castle gates where the deep tone of the portal bell which was struck upon to give notice of their arrival increased the fearful emotions that had assailed Emily. While they waited till the servant within should come to open the gates, she anxiously surveyed the edifice, but the gloom that overspread it allowed her to distinguish little more than a part of its outline, with the mossy walls of the ramparts, and to know that it was vast, ancient, and dreary. The Gothic novels set a harmless fashion for the spine-chilling and the bizarre, combined with a taste for the macabre and the erotic. But once in its stride, Romanticism spatters the establishment with a shower of pungent proposals for its own demise. Merchants of Greek, merchants of Latin, pedants, scholars, Philistines, schoolmasters, pedagogues, I loathe you. With your genius and infallible pompous self-control, you deny grace, beauty, the ideal. Your texts, your laws, your rules are all fossils. In all profundity, you are imbeciles. Victor Hugo. Our dream was to turn.
turn the planet inside out. It is this dream that haunts the romantics. The dream born in the twilight of the 18th century. A dream which will die with the failure of the 1848 revolution. Romanticism is not ridiculous. It is an illness, like sleepwalking or epilepsy. A romantic is a man whose mind has begun to go. He is to be pitied. One must try to reason with him, to bring him round, bit by bit. It is the subject of a medical thesis. Flaubert. The most instantly recognizable symptom of the romantic illness is its frenzy. To the reasonable man, the romantic appears to be in a constant state of desperation, verging on actual despair. In view of the realities of the power struggle in the Europe of the time, there is good reason for the young men to feel world weariness. A feeling of malaise began to ferment in all young hearts condemned to silence by the sovereigns of the entire world, handed over to pedants of all types, to idleness and boredom. The young people saw the foaming waves they longed for withdrawing from them. One faction of the romantics, appalled by the world they see around them, withdraws into a world of fantasy and vision. Odilon Ridon, at the far end of the century, inherits this fantastical world and develops it into his own black, velvety kingdom. Sometimes I cried out, and the night was troubled with my dreams and with my sleeplessness. A hidden apathy gripped my body. The disgust for life that I had felt since childhood was returning, but with redoubled force. Soon my heart no longer fed my thoughts, and the only thing that made me aware of my existence was a deep feeling of boredom. Chateaubriand. Fashion became romanticized. The romantics would agree with Oscar Wilde, only shallow people do not judge by appearances. For the romantics, fine clothes, which are not afraid of being seen as feminine, the clothes of the dandy, all silks and lace, and rich colours reflect the burgeoning state of the soul. It's most extraordinary. I've done nothing all day but worry over the new coat which I tried on this morning, the one that fitted me so badly. I find myself staring at every coat I pass in the street. Eugène Delacroix. The pink waistcoat that Théophile Gautier wears at the opening of Hugo's play, Hermani, makes romantic history. Yeah. It wasn't a red vest. It was pink. That's very important. Was he? No. No. No, pas. Je dors, non. Il dort. C'est mon époux, vois-tu? Le mauvais mot. Nous sommes couchés, là. The play, written with every intention of insulting the aristocracy and infuriating the middle classes, was a smash hit. Not a critical success. It had mixed reviews, but a box office hit. Young artists and young writers loved it. Romanticism does not reside in the choice of subjects. It is a way of feeling. Alfred de Musi. It is the insistence on feeling, on emotion, 
The insistence on putting passion into art, together with the love of the grotesque that leads the romantics to create a value out of experience itself. And for them it is an experience which alternates between the spleen and the ideal, between God and Satan, between the beautiful and the hideous. The flames of experience must be kept burning. The great enemy is boredom. Further and further into the depths into the abyss of imagination and experience. Alcoholism, drugs, eroticism. Rambo, the wild poet of the 1890s, explores a drug-invented world that stands in direct line of descent from the drug journeys of the Romantics. We enter, and here we are among men with shining eyes, purple cheeks, the veins in their temples swollen. These are the regulars of the hashish smokers club. One of them seizes a porcelain saucer from Japan, takes a spoon from the table and extracts a sort of preserve from a crystal vase. It is a concoction of cannabis, Indian hemp, mixed with a greasy substance, honey, and pistachio nuts. As he hands the dose to me, he says, this shall be deducted from your portion of paradise. In the romantic world, it was the fashion to be pale, livid, greenish, a little like a corpse. This fatal air, Byronic, devoured by passion, brought sensitive women to you in droves. They found you interesting and, full of pity that your end was so close, they wanted to make you happy before your death. The meal ends. You enter the salon enclosed with heavy brocade curtains and sink into silence. The intricate and elegant ceilings the intrigue of cornices, these are sufficient to inspire the splendors of hallucination. After a few moments, these companions begin to disappear, leaving no trace, only shadows on the wall like footprints in the sand. The one, leaning, his eyes vague, his arms limp, allows himself to sink into the bottomless sea of dejection. A dead heat runs through my limbs and madness, like a wave foaming on a rock and withdrawing only in order to surge back again, comes and leaves my brain, and in the end, invades it completely. The hallucination, strange host, has lodged itself in my mind. Arthur Rimbaud. The price for carrying through the conceptions of the romantic imagination is high. Art has its boundaries, but the imagination has none. Too late to save lives. Too late Wordsworth sought to curb excesses. To control rebellious passion. For the gods approve the depth and not the tumult of the soul. Byron, dead at 36, a post-mortem shows the brain and the heart of an old man. Schubert, dead at 31. Novalis, sick of life, dies at 29.
painter Jericho, dead at 32. And Keats dies in Rome at the age of 25. Shelley drowns the following year, a book of Keats' poems in his pocket. He is just 29. To be a romantic is not always to sign a death warrant. Of all the romantics, Hugo is perhaps the greatest, and his life spans the century. Oh, what night. Nothing there has contour or age. And the cloud is a phantom, and the phantom is a cloud. The cloud is a phantom, the phantom is a cloud. Beethoven, Goethe, and Schiller, Madame de Stael, Mary Shelley, Chateaubriand, Lord Byron, Coleridge, Blake, and hundreds of others put the match to the gunpowder that was romantic thought and romantic imagination. The explosion that followed lit up Europe for more than half a century, and today its embers, though dying, are far from extinguished. At the least breath, the fire leaps up again. of unpremeditated art. a system or be enslaved by another man's. I will not reason and compare. My business is to create. <laughs> 